Brother Marty, if you'll read that, we sure appreciate it. Psalm 119, starting in verse 137. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your word. Your promise is well tried, and your servant loves it. I am small and despised. Yet I do not forget your precept. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Yeah. Verse 123, trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. The title of the message today is God is Righteous. And to be completely honest with you, we preached the first part of this message two weeks ago, before a week before Christmas, and to have an understanding, I thought we would go back to this because the depths of it cannot be explored. So we spent a few minutes in there in between time, and then last week we preached about how important the Old Testament was in Christmas. And if you remember last week, I said that Going to Christmas services, I would think especially as a lost person or even a person who has heard it so many times before could be boring. And you, we understand the beauty of Christmas and, and, the, and the, the amazing part of the story. But when we see it over and over year after year, we, we lose the context of it. And the context is always important when you're looking at the Bible. And the context, guys, is the Old Testament when it comes to the Christmas story. And that's what we talked about last week. And that context was brought out in the testimony of Zach, Zach, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. Because he brings out passages in the Old Testament when he was prophesying about the birth of his son. So this was important. So here we are in the Old Testament again. It's Psalm 119. We will be in this psalm for a few more weeks as we're now heading downhill and we are seeing the character of who God is in this 31st section of Psalm 119, verse 137 to 144. Thank you, Marty, for reading that passage. And I, I want to give you guys just kind of the gist of what we talked about two weeks. The psalm... The section of this psalm brings it out so that the righteousness of God is really a practice of established order. But look at the top there on the screen. The holiness of God is who he is. And so when it's translated to us, who are his saints, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are a saint, that is your position. And when God sees you, he doesn't see your failures. He doesn't see the sin that was in your life or even the sin that will happen today or the sin that will happen in the future. He sees you, guys, he sees you as saints, holy, separated from all the sin of this world. And so it's a unique position that we have. And as a result, we don't feel like we have to come to church doing good works. We don't feel like we have to read our Bible. We don't feel like we have to pray. We don't feel like we have to help our neighbor. We don't feel like we have to do any of these things because we want to do them. He is holy and his righteousness is established. Guys, guess what? As a result of us, he sees us holy. We want to practice him. Why? He loved us because we first loved him. Righteousness in the Old Testament is 206 times. It is 87 times in the New Testament. And it means to be obedient. And we immediately put negative connotations to it. And it's so wrong. We want to have righteous acts as statements of love of who God is. We have that chance to be that light, that witness. 2021 is coming. We know that. 2021 is here and we can be that person of righteousness, which means righteous acts, doing things that will be a blessing to people, 
setting aside things that would be time for us that we could do for others. And so you look in your life because of a saint, you believe in Jesus Christ, you know you're saved, righteousness is there, holiness is a result. This is where this section of the psalm is. There is a third word, and holiness you can't really find, but you find the separation that David puts in the section, and that separation, anytime you separate from anything, you remove yourself from a situation that's bad. We think of our young people, and you know, Elisha's birthday's today. It's, it, it's, it's great because now you've got chances to separate yourself from things. And we always think of that as a 16 year old, the decisions you're gonna be making in the next few years. Mom, mom's gonna be praying, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's gonna affect you for the rest of your life. But even as a 64 year old, the decisions that I'm going to make are going to have affected me for the rest of my life, Howbeit, it will probably be shorter than yours. You've got to make the right decisions, but so does Pastor Bobby. And so we stand as a result of Christ's positioning of his holiness and who he is. But now we want to act in righteousness, and, and the act of it is being obedient, and it's making the right choices. Taking that time and saying, I will do this because I prefer to do this because of what God has done for me. So the righteousness and uprightness of who God is is transferred to us as a result of his holiness. And so that separation of holiness is something that's not going to be popular, but it's something you should do. But you can also, I like to put it this way, show love to these folks and that will show them the need of a sacrificial life. Leviticus 11.44 says, I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy as I am holy. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48 put it this way and said that in order for you to know God, you must be holy. And in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Pharisees, the religious crowd of that time could not understand it. You must be holy. You can't be by all your good works of righteousness. It is imparted upon you. A.W. Tozer put it this way. He said, God's holiness, he said, God's holiness he does not conform to a standard. He is the standard, and we must conform to him. And that's why we sing, holy, holy, holy. Isaiah 6, Isaiah saw it, and when he saw the holiness of God, the throne in heaven, he said, I am a man of unclean lips. So that righteousness and that holiness is the position and the practice of who our God is. I hope you understand that. That means and understand you are sanctified, not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done for you. And it is powerful. And we took time with this last week. We'll not take that time this week, but to show forth how important it is. Guys, I just want you to see this. The character is holiness of who you are. And then the righteousness means your behavior, what you do. And so that's important. That matches up with what you believe. The testimony of Christ will be as concerning with the character of your life and who you are. And so that's the practice that we must have. Guys, I shot literally right at 80% my free throws when I was in college playing basketball. It was a good free throw percent. Most kids don't have that nowadays. But the reason why I did that was because I practiced the same form day in and day out. What that means is you must practice prayer, reading the scripture, and meditating on it day in and day out. If I didn't practice the form, and when I became a coach, this was the form I did. You know how I would tell the kids to get the right form? I would say, imagine you're, you're at the counter in your kitchen and you want a cookie and the cookie jar is too high. And I would say to them, you got to get that cookie, but mom doesn't want you climbing on the, on the, on the cabinets, on the, on the counter. So what do you do? You go up, you reach real high into the cookie jar and you don't look for the cookie. You don't look at which cookie it is, but you grab the cookie and you pull it out. 
when you shoot your free throws, you reach real high into the cookie gar, jar and it goes in every time. That's how you shoot the free throws. Now that's a little tip, isn't it? How many of y'all are gonna spend much time shooting free throws this week? Probably not very many, but <laughs> what tips, what practices do you have to add to your behavior of being Christ-like, to show forth a righteous life? You need to find them. This is the end of the year, the last Sunday we're gonna to be together. I have shared with you tips on how to read the Bible and apply the Bible and understand it. I hope each and every day you find what is comfortable for you. I don't care if it's one verse that you meditate on throughout the day or you read such as my friend did. He would read literally about 20 chapters a day. He was getting through the Bible every month. I have a friend that was reading it 12 times a year and marked it and made notes and at the end of the year would buy a new Bible and mark it and make notes. Let me tell you something, after 16 years, he could quote from Genesis to Revelation. But it took him 16 years of that practice. Can you imagine? Don't think that's too hard. We mentioned the young man is 16 years old. That's the practice that it took him to do that. I never got 100% in the free throw making. But maybe if I'd have kept practicing, how much practice are you going to put in to your spiritual devotions, your meditation, your prayer, and your Bible in 2021? If it's important to you, you will find the tips and the means to get into that area so that our position in Christ can hopefully be drawn closer to our practice in Christ and that we can establish truly holiness of God around the earth. You got to practice it, guys. That's all I'm saying. That's good preaching, isn't it? You see that? All of a sudden, it doesn't sound as bur burdensome. Find the tips. I'll tell you, there are many people that are taking the smartphones and using them. And I used to have an aversion to this. I wasn't crazy about smartphones. I'll tell you that. I just know how I wanted people to read their Bibles and smartphones. And then I've got Marty coming up reading the Bible up in the morning worship service with his smartphone. You know what? It's a great practice. There's nothing wrong with that. If that gets you into the Word, some people are not readers. There's audio Bibles. You can have it read to you. And so there's whatever you can find. What practices for you? What works for you? Find that time you get alone with God and you make it work. And you find it in the area of the righteousness in your practice because of the holiness God's given you. That's powerful. I promise you. And God will do this. We're not going to take this time to look at all this scripture. But I just want to key in on a couple of key verses here. This is what we used two weeks ago. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So there's the law and the commandments for obedience. But the righteousness is now being displayed because of what Moses has shared with us. We should look at areas that we can establish. But look at verse 22. But the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no, now notice this, there's no difference. There's no distinction. So because of what God's imparted upon us, we have that. And there's the power that we can see. Here's the third word I wanted to see. And the reason why we're in Romans 3, verse 24 is, and are justified. That's the third word. It's God's justice and God's righteousness on display. Look at verse 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now those are tough, tough verses and they are deep verses. Not just verse 23, which I purposely skipped that most know, but we see that the righteousness of Christ has been applied to us by the propitiation means the sacrifice, the switch. Much like in Bible study that we're leading, learning today about Isaac being the possible sacrifice God's heart was testing Abraham as a result. God tests us to see, are we going to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ 
and his blood. And that's the righteousness that we get and the power of what God has. It's called atonement and it's called as a result. It's, an, it's, a, it's a musical term. It means atonal. You know what that means? It means it goes with the flow. We go symbolically and systematically right into God's established righteousness. And that is the power that God gives because he is the justifier. And we talked about this two weeks ago with Sarah and Abraham. Notice when she's upset with him, she says in 16, Genesis 16, verse 5, May the Lord judge between you and me. She knew that Abraham was to be the representative of who God was in establishing righteousness for the family. He didn't do it right, even through Ishmael and, and through the uh, Hagar, the handmaiden, when they did this. And we talked all about that last week, but I wanted you guys to see this. Abraham, two chapters later, Genesis 18, verse 25, says that God... You are the judge of all the earth. So get the picture here now. I want you all to see this and hang with me. You have the holiness of God, which makes us righteousness, and we have the judgment of God abated from us. If you do not recognize who God is in his holiness, in his lordship, in his kingdom, you cannot get his righteousness. Therefore, you will be justified. You, excuse me, you will be judged and not justified. Get that picture. That's what salvation really is. It's not just praying a prayer and asking Lord to uh, get you out of this trouble and, and not let you go to hell. It's not just fire insurance. What it is, is recognizing who God is, knowing his holiness, just like Isaiah saw, then seeing the righteousness that will be transferred into you, even though you're not, even though we're going to sin today, even though we mess up every day, that's where God is truthful and all are liars. That's so powerful. And so then we understand it's the righteousness that has been imputed onto us. We now have the judgment abated. But if you do not recognize the holiness and who God is and is Jesus as Lord, you can't do it. Nor can you practice righteousness. You lose and you fail. And we all slip and fall. But those who try to earn their way to heaven, they cannot. And that was the problem that Jesus had with the religious crowd at that time. So this is the power of what God has for each and every one of us. So that's why all that was introduction to get to this today. God is righteous part two. And that God is righteous here. Here's what I want you to see from the outline of who God is. Just a little better understanding of his holiness and his righteousness as we begin to look at it, I broke it down this way in very simple ways. God's righteous word in Psalm, 130, Psalm 119, verse 137 to 138. Number two, God's purifying word and God's eternal word, 142 to 144. And so we have this in the passages before us that Marty read. And I want you to notice here, because we go right at the beginning of judgment and rules and all the things that happen. Here's David writing this, and you see how righteous his word is. Righteous are you, O Lord. Right are your, your rules. And in most translations, it says right are your judgments. Right are your precepts of declaring judgment. That's what it means. Right and right judgment. We've all seen amazing things happening over the last 20 years of how the judges in our country some people will do a crime that would be just minuscule, such as a small drug crime, and get years and years and years and stay in longer in jail than some people who have killed someone and the judge makes the decision and they're out in just a few years even though they committed murder. And we know that it's human error. Many times it's purely because of just different areas of the of the country or different areas of the states and all these things happen but small crimes should relate to small penalties large crimes could ultimately be the death of an individual and that we base from the old testament and so here's david he's recognizing that god is the one who makes proper judgment right look at verse 137 again righteous are you O lord and right are you we, we make mistakes, but he won't. 
So we have the perfect word of God. And when it's applied into our hearts, I can't speak for anyone else. I can't even make judgment for anybody else because I'm a flawed human being. But when I begin to apply the word of God in my life, the righteousness of his word straightens me up, brings me into a right mindset. It puts me upright in the, my personal dealings. I still will lie. I'm still going to fail him. But I have a chance to walk a little straighter. To be rough right. To really be fixated on the things that are important. This means that there is a standard and that standard is God. A few weeks ago we talked about a plumb line. Y'all remember that? It was about three stanzas ago around Psalm 110, Psalm 119 and early 100s. And you pop that line to make that straight line. You stay on that line. And that's reiterated in the, the New Testament. This week, I want to think of it as just a little bit different way. If we say that, as like A.W. Tozer said, God is the standard. He doesn't make standards. He is the standard. Think of it as this way as a, a bounty marker, a literally land marker. What the Bible called as a landmark. And they would do this all in the Holy Lands. They would take a stone and they would establish it. And that would be part of the corners of the areas that they would land. They wouldn't necessarily have fences because travel was to go through that. And so they, they, they would go through their lands with travel. But you recognize you were on somebody's land. They would have established roads. And that's how countries were eventually formed. But these markers are important. And I, I ended last two weeks ago with saying that I had an issue with a border on our property. Come to find out, my marker was a foot and a half too long. I didn't want to move, but I did it because the neighbor said, you have 18 inches of my land going all the way down the line. I first thought was, well, that's not really that big a deal, but he was putting the fence down. It became a big deal. And so he through the process of uh, changing it with the county, had a survey a team. I said, do you need any help with that price? He said, no, we've got this. He said, don't worry about it. So we moved the marker. Let me tell you what's happening in the world today. God has his established laws, rules, his precepts, ultimately his judgments because of his holiness, because of him being separated from us, from our sin. We, though, Take these markers and these landmarks of the boundaries that God set us in and we move them all the time. And there's where the problem comes. We change and we change because of society. We change because of culture. We change because, and God did not intend. When you say, now, Pastor Bobby, is, is God expected us to go to the Jewish practices of Saturday? No. Worship and all the, the dietary laws? No. But through Christ, that's fulfilled. And the apostle, in particular Paul, talks about that in his 13 letters in the New Testament of what were the main rules, what were the main judgments that concern life, love, and heaven. And there's where it changes. It doesn't hurt. We know there are things that, they, that were given to the Jews in the literally precepts and the subsets of those precepts that helped them, they had a very, very strict life, but it wasn't something that they missed. God was showing that his rules and judgments are right. And so it's fulfilled in Christ because he did it all. I'll give you an example that's in the law today, in Leviticus. I've got different types of clothes on, not all cotton, I wish it were, but the Bible says that you're supposed to keep in the Old Testament, the same type of clothing on. You couldn't change from wool to flax to something else. For us, it would be plastic now or polyester. I remember one time, y'all remember we had Mark Lowry singing for us a couple weeks ago? I was with him and I kid you not, he looked at me and he said, why are you wearing that polyester suit? Now this dates me, right? He said, you get yourself a good wool suit. And then he laughed and he said, that will make you look way more presentable and way more professional. And now, now I don't think he would say that because of the way times have changed. But it's okay. Polyester did have certain stigma about it. But I was shiny in my suit, I promise you. It was funny, but it was true to the Old Testament. We don't have to do that now. All of that's been fulfilled by Christ. But the major laws 
and the landmarks of the Bible should never be moved. And help us to remember this. I want you all to look at the scripture here. Proverbs 22, verse 28. Solomon teaching. They, he really got this from David because they established the borders with David, the king, and Solomon, his son. The Bible says that the borders of all of Israel were finally established by the 12 tribes. It didn't happen with Moses, surely, and it really didn't happen with Joshua. The land didn't get to find rest from all its enemies 400 years later with David. And David is standing. Now notice what he says to Solomon. Do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. Solomon is actually teaching now his son. He's the one who recorded this, but he got this from David. And he's saying, the borders of Israel, they're ours. They're ours. Now, this is, this is worth coming to church for today. I want y'all to catch this. Okay? This is important. Does Israel have those borders today? Do they go all the way to the river Euphrates? Do they go all the way through Saudi Arabia and then down to Egypt? No. If I had the time, I would put the map on the screen. Israel's got a little strip of what's the promised land. You know why? Because their borders have been moved because of their sin. And it's the same thing with Christians in the church. The church becomes marginalized in society and we do not have the influence anymore because of our sin. We're still holy in our position, but our practice in righteousness has gone and our influence is gone and our borders have been moved. Israel is a great picture of this. They're no more. They eventually lost it. And they went 2,000 years until 1948, they got the little slither. And then in 67, they got a little bit more. And you got to understand, there are Palestinians, the Arab world, they are saying it's theirs, but we know that one day Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to reclaim those borders. Look at verse 28 again. Do not move the ancient landmark. How do you not move the landmarks in your life? By practicing righteousness and holiness and your influence will broaden and, and, and not you will reclaim what God has for you. I believe that in all put proprieties of your life not just in witnessing to the lost or being a blessing to them I believe it's also true in your personal life as far as how God moves and directs you by the will of God and all of a sudden you see these borders open up it's powerful I want you to look at this next scripture because this really lends itself in Hosea 5 verse 10 the princes of Judah have become like those get this who move the land Upon them I will pour out my wrath like water. They, they were lost. And they have sacrificed the goodness of God. And as a result, they lost their borders. They had moved the ancient landmarks. One of my favorite names for a church is Landmark Baptist Church. You know what that meant? That meant we are establishing ourselves on the rock. And this rock doesn't move. Because he is the standard. And that's what we need to see in our life is that God's got borders for you. He knows how far they are. You don't. Abraham got to know the borders and it was promised to Israel. And trust me, in the seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ in the second coming, it will be restored. And all those who are the saints will join them and get to see Israel restored and the king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. How powerful is that? That's what he wants to do in our hearts and lives. We know it won't be perfect until we're in heaven. But I'm going to ask you, how close are you now? How much practice are you doing? We have the chance for this next year to begin a new and a fresh, a new year. Oh, 2020 was so bad. Now, that's not true for everyone. I want you to realize people are always dying. There's always sickness. There's always pain. We seem to have this that we don't understand very well. And so that's what's new with COVID-19. But know this, God can take 2021 and enlarge your borders. I don't believe it's through Jacob's prayer and a magical type thing. That was a thing that was going on a few years ago. But I do believe spiritually in your heart and your life, he can allow for the power of God to flow through. And as a result, his glory is shining through your life. That's what we need. It's not for prosperity to put in our pocket. 
David is real showing Solomon this is what needs to happen here. He's got, if you look here in verse 31, 37, a burning desire because those linen marks have been moved. And so powerful is it. I want you to look at verse 140 for a minute here. I want you guys just to see this. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves this. He's now seeing the purifying, number two, the purifying of the word of God. As a result of the righteousness that comes in, the word becomes, and it's a burning, look at 139, a burning desire to see, because those people have moved those landmarks. Now in verse 140, the word of God, though, is pure to him. Your promise is well tried. It's like being tried in a fire. We, I, I, again, I'm just amazed at how much we were talking about the trials uh, that Abraham went and the difference between temptations and trials in Bible study today. And I knew verse 140 was coming up. You are tried. It means you are purified through fire. And so as a result, you are able to be used in great ways. And what we think of that will be used in great ways, again, has nothing to do with prosperity. It has to do with the will of God. That fire is not comfortable, is it? That fire draws out our impurities. I, 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 got, I, get, I had this as, a, as a, a picture, but I didn't want to put it up there until I checked copyrights on it, but when 1948, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, we're talking thousands of books of scriptures, okay? Thousands of books of scriptures. And there was one Jewish man, his name was Gabriel Barclay. Gabriel Barclay was looking through all these scrolls and he found a little scroll about this big. And it was a copper scroll and it was woven very tightly and it was very old. Before the, Jew, the people in the Jewish antiquities unrolled the copper scroll, it's the only metal scroll. All the other ones were like little mummies cases, clay cases with the scrolls put inside them. And it was the word of God. And what's interesting, tying back into Christmas, when Zacharias said that John was going to be, John the Baptist was going to be away from us, the very next verse says in Luke that John the Baptist was in the wilderness. This is probably the area he was at in the area of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he was with a group called the Essenines, and they were scribes writing the Old Testament over and over. And there are thousands of them. There's probably still more out there, and they've been kept for thousands of years. Well, they tested this little copper scroll. I mean, it was it really was metal scroll, scroll that was etched the Hebrew on. Hebrew, by the way. There are people in the promised land, because the borders got moved, and they say you're not there. They're finding Hebrew documents. How did they get there if they weren't supposed to be there? Y'all hear me? Y'all catching that? It just makes sense, right? It's their land. But that land today belongs to another country where they found it. Here's the deal. They didn't want to open it up. They tested it and they found out that this particular scroll, the copper scroll, very small, was 2,400 years old. It's the oldest metal document of any writing. And they said, oh, what scripture is going to be on there? Well, they finally picked a day in 1952 through painstaking unraveling, knowing that this metal could just crumble to dust in a matter of seconds. They devised, the Jewish people, the Jewish experts to devise a formula to unscroll, and they began to unravel the scroll that book and they unraveled it and they were so excited to see what scripture was it was it Ruth and was it Genesis which one this is a, this is the only metal one that they found it wasn't any of it there was no, no Bible verses there was no passage of scripture on the metal scroll they considered it to be the most valuable thing ever this copper scroll and you know what it was it was a outline a Bullet pointed almost, it wasn't bullet points, but literally a list of things that went into the temple. But think about that for a second. The temple had been destroyed once. These men, I believe, knew it was probably going to be destroyed again. And in 70 AD it was. Guess what? We're almost 2,000 years to that point. They're going to need that list when they rebuild the third temple. Only it's not going to be King David, King Solomon. It's not going to be any of the Jewish kings. It's going to be King Christ sitting on that. And the Bible says that King Jesus will be sitting on that throne. 
So that copper scroll had all the elements of what was in the temple, just in case you didn't see it in the books of the Bible. And here's what's else interesting about that copper scroll. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because I thought it was going to be one of the books of the Bible. But it had the word Jehovah written in it. In every document in the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they come to the name of God, they do not spell it out. But that little thing had the name of Jehovah spelled out. It was spelled out because it was a list to keep things in their proper context. And so that was the first time Jewish people, when they unraveled it, saw ancient documents with the name God in it. How powerful is that? It wasn't considered to be scripture. Guys, the reason why I bring that whole story up to you is because this is what's pure. As amazing as that copper scroll was, what you've got in your lap, or like Marty on his smartphone, is way more valuable, way more precious than anything that any of the purest of metals can be. You are purified through the word of God, and that is way more. Psalm 119 says you are purified seven times more than gold. You know what that means in Psalm 119 when he says very much related to Psalm 119? It means this purification is so beautiful in your life. It should break your heart and, and create a burning desire, a zeal for those who forget. Notice what it says in verse 139. They forget the word. How, how our hearts should break. But yet translate that broken heart to a purity that God's given to us. Because we're in the word. We're not going to look down upon people. We're going to bring it to them at their level. And be the living word that we possibly can be. So that they can see all the name of God. So that they can understand it. God's word is pure. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this way. says that each and every one of us should rightly divide the word of truth. You know what that means? Keep it in its context. That's why I love Bible study. Is we go slow because there is a content. You can pick Bible verse out from here and a Bible verse from out from here. And you got Bible gymnastics. It means you're hopping around all over the place and you can't do anything. We've got the scriptures and the context of the scriptures are important. And so that's what will bring out this purity and this zeal. So much so that it becomes the most powerful thing in the world. It is pure and it is righteous. Because notice this, verse 141. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. You know what that means? That means that there's going to be friction with people who do not agree with you about the word of God. But you stand your ground. Even though you're small and seemingly insignificant, God has a wonderful way of taking the things that don't matter, the little things, and bringing them to light and using them just like a babe in a manger. Just like a poor peasant couple who we would consider homeless nowadays, by the way. And he will take them and use them in great and wonderful ways by the purity of his word. God's word is true. Our word is a lie. We need to get that purity in our heart and our life by our practice of righteousness. In ways. I want you to look at the last point here. By the way, I did have a picture of the scroll there. But our last, uh, just so you guys can look at it, it wasn't very big, but all of that is metal there. Isn't that something? Pretty amazing. And it was really a temple scroll of the ornaments that were in the temple. But now look at the third thing, God's eternal word. And with this we close. His eternal word is this is the book that has stood the test of time. Heaven and earth will pass away. In the same passage that God said we have to be perfect to God's holiness, in Matthew chapter 5, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last for all eternity. It's not the majority rules with God. It is. He is the ruler of all, and he rules through everything. And if I could chart this out, what it really means here is this. You have the three pillars. You have the world, you have the church, and you have the word. And what happens is, the word's on one side, the world is on the other. And if I had time this week, I would have put this out on the screen for you. 
But the world moves further away year after year from the word, doesn't it? It's been doing that for 2,000 years, in particular from the living word, Jesus Christ. The church should be moving this direction closer to the word. But what do we do as believers? Well, we like that. It's more interesting over there. And when they move their standards, when they move their landmarks in our personal lives, and sad to say in churches, we move our standards. And we are separate from the world, but it's like this. They move, and then we move. They move. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Remember the first cuss word in movie history? Y'all remember it? It was that song of the South. Excuse me, not the song of the South. It was the, um, the one with Scarlett O'Hara. What's that Gone movie? With Gone with the Wind. And Clark Gable came down there, and he used the first cuss word. First one. Broke all barriers. That was done in the 40s. Guess what now? Do we have cuss words in media today? Yes, we do. From presidents all the way down to Hollywood actors, our language is filthy. Guess what's happening now? And I hate to tell you this, but we have, I've known preachers for years that used to cuss. Knew that back in my 70s. I had one preacher that was a friend of mine. If the choir wasn't singing good enough, he'd cuss the choir while he was up on the platform. Not joking, because they weren't doing it right. And he was a pastor in Fort Worth, Texas. But guess what? We have pastors now cussing in the messages and putting them out on YouTube and everywhere else. The move, what I'm, my, my, the ancient, do not move the ancient landmarks. And we know the, the cardinal doctrine should never be. But even in our practices, why are we doing that? When Paul says in three different scriptures in the, in the epistles, watch your language. Don't let it be salty. Let it show forth love and compassion. But we do just the opposite. World, did the Bible move? Did it ever move? It stays the same, doesn't it? But we're doing the same thing. Don't you do that in your personal life. And if this pastor gets that way, I'm not talking about just in the area of cussing, but I'm talking, if I get where I am following the trends of this world, God help me. Y'all stop me. You hearing me? That's what he wants us to do because it is his eternal word. I want you guys to look at it as we close this out. Your righteousness is righteous forever. It doesn't change. Your law is true. He's not lying. It is right. The word of God is truth. John 17, 7 says, verse 142 says, the law is true. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way that what? The truth. John, 1 John 5 says that the spirit of God is truth. That's what, it's not what's popular. You stay with the word, you stay with the law, you stay with Jesus, and you stay with the Holy Spirit. And God's the Father, and you stay with the truth. And everyone else is liars. And we all are. This is what, though, shouldn't make you depressed. It should console you. Because I want you to look at verse 143. Trouble and anguish have I found, found me in my life, but your commandments are my delight. Even though I see what is fixed, even though I am wishy-washy like the waves, I see the beacon that is the light that is fixed. And I can cling to that. And I can hold to that. And so, no longer am I following the ways of the world. I am now following the direction of the Bible. And I'm getting as close to it as I possibly can. Not so I can get heady knowledge and to all these people that don't know anything. Why? So that I can be pleasing to God and glorifying Him. And showing enormous compassion to others. That's the unfailing word of God. That's the truth of the scriptures. I want you guys just to see this. Don't do this. You stay with that book. You don't remove them. And you hold to that. And you make that a constant practice of going after it and loving him as much as you can. All the uncertainty that we've seen in 2020, I promise you it's going to happen again in 2021. It's not going to be anything new. It may be a new direction. It may be something else. Could be precursors to leading us into the great tribulation. But I want you to know this. 
I'm holding on to the ancient landmark that the Father put down. So I am not worried about it because it's not my truth as I view it. It's his truth, and he is the author of truth. God is righteous. I promise you that. He is righteous. And we must stay with that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? When I coached, I would try to use hints for our players. So the cookie jar at the free throw line improved a lot of players' free throw shooting. It worked.